Hey, welcome to Speechless. And we got a fan, another fantastic, very interesting show for you today about the judiciary again. And one particular judge out of Dakota County, Judge Lennon, who just seems to be really messing up quite a bit. And our guest later on in the show will be John Miser, who was on about three, uh, one of the four weeks ago, uh, and talking about um, Judge Lennon's oath of office not being filed, which is a serious issue. It's a vacancy. We're going to re recap that uh, briefly. Uh, but the big issue here is uh, did Judge Lennon um, extort, um, uh, embezzle money uh, from an account and use it for fraudulent purposes? And so we're going to lay out the evidence of that today. So, um, We'll get to that uh, later on, but we're going to first cover Maplewood and challenging and what that was like to be a, uh, there's no such thing as a poll challenger, you're just a challenger. And also, uh, we're going to talk about the conventions on the right of persons with disabilities. And the big issue there is that uh, there's supposed to be a hearing coming up and it's been postponed. So that's, that's interesting. I'm sure they're going to have it, but we'll see what takes place here. But first of all, uh, I want to get into Maplewood challenging. You know, when you go out to vote, you have election judges and you have um, what are called challengers. And these uh, challengers can be from the candidate who's running, if it's a nonpartisan race, of course, there's no such thing as nonpartisan. All these races are now officially endorsed candidates. Uh, there's no secret about that. Even the judgeships uh, are get endorsements, which is fine with me. Um, just because a political party endorses a candidate, that doesn't mean that's a bad thing. Because you have all other kinds of endorsements. You have the battered women's shelters, you have Ask Me, you have all these different groups, um, which you have freedom of association, but you have all these groups endorsing candidates in nonpartisan races. So let's get this notion there, there is no such thing as nonpartisan. It just doesn't happen. And, and don't buy into it. Everything's political. There's not one thing that isn't political. Everything has a moral basis to it. It just happens to be what is that moral basis. So in our system of elections, uh, there's checks and balances in that election system. And one of the checks and balances is poll, is challenging for on behalf of a candidate, making sure that those uh, who are eligible to vote get to vote and those that aren't eligible to vote don't get to vote. And that creates consternation because if you're making sure that the process is going correctly for your candidate, you're seen as somebody and you'll get labeled as somebody who is trying to suppress the vote and trying to discourage people from voting. And, th and that's just not the case because we, we see people come in and they say, uh, I'm eligible to vote, and, but I'm not a citizen. Well, if you're not a citizen, you can't vote. But we saw that happen. I want to vote, but I'm not a citizen. What can I do? Um, well, you can't vote. And, and they, you know, they walk away. But some of them think they can vote. Now, another thing, if they wouldn't have said they're not a citizen, then they got to do, uh, you know, go through the process of determining whether they're eligible to vote or not. Uh, but one thing that most people don't know, and it's not taught, there's no documentation on this for the election process, is that on your driver's license, down in the bottom right-hand corner, it will say um, status check. If it says status check, that means you're not a citizen and you can't vote. And it was very interesting from the poll watchers that went out in the Maplewood area that went to the various uh, precinct polling places, the number of the election judges did not know that. They said they weren't trained in that. One of them said, yes, I knew it, uh, but they weren't trained. You know, they just knew it. Uh, so as a very fascinating subject matter and 
and, and you know, that, that's a big issue because if you're not being trained in this and you see it right in front of your eyes that it says status check, you know right away they can't vote. But if you don't know that, they can still slip through the system. Now, that's what a poll challenger is helpful for to educate election judges, even though they should be educated, on how the polling works and who can vote. Well, one of the strategies that's used, and I think it's been used in Maplewood uh, successfully for a while, um, it, it was they, they, what they've been doing in Maplewood is saying, okay, you're a challenger, you got this seat, here's where you get to sit, you don't get to walk around, you don't get to see what's going on, and we'll talk in whisper tones so that you can't hear. And they'll come and say to you, well, you have to have prior knowledge. Well, there's no such thing in the law as prior knowledge. It says you have to have personal knowledge of the person you're challenging. Now, personal knowledge means information that you gather prior or right then through conversation or sight. That means, and there is no restriction on where an election judge can go except for the six feet from, uh, from the ballot boxes and six feet from when the, where people fill out uh, their election forms. So you have a restriction, but where the new registrations, where the old registrations and where the ballots are hand out, that election, that a challenger has the ability and the right to go to all those spots to see what's going on. And, but I can tell you over the last four years, I've been told to sit in my spot and they have moved the tables as far away as they could. Not every time, okay, but then when I find that out, you know, I call the lawyers and they say, no, move them in, you know, and just, just stay in that spot. And I said, but I can't hear. I can't hear what they're saying. They're trying to not have me hear what they're doing. And, and I can't see when these driver's licenses are being pulled out and, and I can't see. And so I go through this routine, and this year I said, look, I get to walk wherever I need to walk. I get to see and I get to hear the conversations going on, and I get to talk to the election judges. <clears throat> I can't be disruptive. That's the issue. I cannot be disruptive. But being disruptive does not mean uh, holding the people accountable to the laws and doing a, a challenge. But just so... it. It was a very, very interesting thing, and we'll have a show on this. We're going to produce some videos on how to be a, a challenger, how to be an election judge, the issues in training, because it was just amazing what is not being done. Our state is not doing their job in training our people, nor are they using technology to the right way uh, to, to teach people the way it should be taught, and it's just too bad. Um, because everybody needs to know this stuff. It's just, it, it is fascinating what goes on. So Maplewood has had a problem because they, our election judges have not been trained properly from what I can tell. Um, and although where I am at, the ele head election judge, very cordial, we get along great. Um, you still have to, you know, you just have to do things you shouldn't have to do. And it, it's not the head election judge, but it's a, and an election judge that was telling me, you know, right away, I, you know, when I first walked over to another area, uh, it was Judy Johansson. She gets up and goes to the head judge and says, he can't be there. And I said, yes, I can. I can be over, over at the uh, ballot area to see what's going on to make sure things are handled properly. And the head election judge said that was correct. I, I didn't have that conversation, but I had the conversation with the head judge beforehand. So then... Um, Another time, and I wanted to see what was happening in a certain situation uh, that wasn't proper, and I came over to the area, and Judy Johansson told me, hey, you can't be here. And I said, yeah, I can. Uh, there's no restriction on me not being here. Uh, you know, so, uh, but, you know, after that, we all had a cordial time and, you know, did whatever we needed to do. So, uh, and some of the challengers really, really had a hard time. Some were threatened with police coming and arresting them. Uh, some, some didn't have a problem at all. Everything went fine. Uh, but it just depended on the head judge and how 
cooperative they wanted to be or not. But some of them just took it as a personal offense that you even showed up. Like, what, is there something wrong that I'm doing here? But no, I, I get to be here for the candidate, that's all. You know, <laughs> so uh, it's, it's an amazing deal. Okay, uh, next area. I want you to know about this. We talked about it last week, but the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disability is, is uh, coming up for a vote. It's still in the Senate committee. And we showed the clips last week of Michael Ferris getting hammered by the senators, uh, unjustly so, um, saying that his uh, doctorate degree in international uh, law was from an online law school or law, online course. Well, it wasn't. It was from the most prestigious uh, international law school in in the world, you know, uh, according to some people, a lot of people, and the and the teachers are fully engaged in international treaties and law, and so it was just a big slam. Well, they were going to have testimony today on this conventions on the persons with rights to disability in the Senate, and they postponed it for another week. And the talk is that uh, they got big problems. They're realizing this would be the first treaty that would go into where the United Nations can come into our families and dictate how we raise our children, how we deal with our homes, and it is beyond the pale. The United States is the best in the world as far as people with disabilities. We're an example to the world. We don't need to sign a treaty that allows the US, UN to come in and tell us how to do it. It just doesn't need to be done. And in that process, parents lose the right to raise their children uh, in the upbringing and education of their choice. And that's what you're seeing going on in Germany, in Sweden, where homeschooling parents are losing custody of their kids. It's that serious. And so, people, I want you to know, I want you to turn to graph, uh, graph number 19 in there. And this is a quote from Edmund Burke. And if you watch the end of my show, you'll hear me say, uh, good men don't do nothing. Okay, and the, re the reason I say it is because of this quote by uh, Sir Edmund Burke. But he's just a man, okay? He's not any better than you or more important or less important. Okay, he's just a man that came up with a saying, just like my saying, good men don't do nothing, makes me super special. <laughs> okay, uh, but let's, uh, graphic number 19, or did you add some more in there? Okay, uh, it's, it's, it's in on black and um, it has a signature writing in there. We'll, we'll get that because it's an important quote to know because it's true. That's the question. So what if somebody says something? The question is, is what they said the truth? And his quote is the truth. Well, they're scrambling for it, but it basically says something like this. When evil men conspire, and there it is, when bad, when bad men combine, the good must associate, else they will fall, one by one, an unpitied sacrifice in a contemptible struggle. Is that the truth? I say it is the truth. Okay, so good, good men got to get together. Um, um, now, people have taken that quote and said, all it takes for evil to triumph is for good men to do nothing. Okay, he never said that. There's no record of him saying that. That's the record of what he said. Can you put that graphic up again? And, and my point is on this issue here is that... Um, the good must associate, you know, and that's why I say good men don't do nothing, you know. So you can't call somebody a good man if they see evil coming and evil people conspiring and then do nothing. That's not a good man. A good man finds other good men to organize to overthrow the evil. So um, that's why I have that at the end of the show, and that's why it's so important to call your senators in Minnesota here, because this is a treaty that affects our laws, uh, and it will be the first treaty that does that, that affects domestic laws. Uh, it will come in and it will tell us how to live our lives. The foreign nations will do that, and it's just, it's just wrong all the way. Okay, um, 
So let's go now to the, the video here of uh, the judges on selling out. And uh, it's on the, uh, yeah, on the graphic there. We're scrambling back here. <laughs> so uh, the selling out, there we go. It's not so hard to find a buyer for you when money talks. You're under its spell. Ah, but what do you have when there's nothing left to sell? Selling out. I'd rather call it compromise. Is easy to do. Sometimes you have to close your eyes. It's not so hard. Being rich is no disgrace. To find a buyer for you. Put Ooh. on your shoes and join the race. Oh, and money talks. It has a very soothing voice. You're under its spell. It's up to you to make the choice. Ah, but what do Before you, you have know it, when there's be nothing, nothing left to, to sell? sell. Always break the rules People who try are fools When you get older Maybe then you will see I've always found ideals Don't take the place of meals That's how it is And how it will always be It's so nice to have integrity I'll tell you why if you really have integrity, it means your price is very high. So remember when you start to preach and moralize that we all are in the game and brother, its name is compromise. It's so nice Selling to have integrity. I'll tell you why. You it's not so hard to have integrity. And there's Judge Lennon, our next judge on the list of judges that have sold out. And uh, that's what we'll be talking about the rest of the show here. But before we do that, I do have a caller on the line that had a question of, or comment about uh, earlier in the show. So we'll give him a shot here. Caller, do you have a comment or a question? Yeah, Tim, I have a, I have a comment and kind of a question. Um, okay. The couple, the, one thing I wanted to say is about, about people being able to have the right to vote or going into a polling place and voting and they didn't have the right to vote. The only thing that's been proven on that is that people that have been convicted of a crime or convicted of a felony and had to have their voting rights taken away, then those people um, voted by accident. Those numbers are very low. And the second comment I wanted to say was about the right of the persons with disabilities, the treaty. Right. By having that treaty, you only promote and protect the rights of persons with disabilities. So to say that by interacting that treaty, that it takes away your right as a parent to raise your ch child the way you'd like, I think that's very untrue and misleading, and it's very degrading to most of us with people with disabilities. All right, caller, thank you. Um, well, I, I can tell you this, uh, you know, just a part on the first part in relationship to voters. Um, I know a number of situations where people went in, I know them some personally, where they went in to vote and somebody already signed on their name with their name. So they couldn't vote and, and they were ticked off. But see, how can you prosecute that? You know, you, you would have to have videos in the polling place and to show when that happened, you'd have to have audio. There is none uh, there. And we know that there's approximately, I think, 221 people who are convicted in uh, Ramsey, Hennepin County, a number of counties for voter fraud, uh, for voting when they shouldn't. And we still have over between two elections some uh, 55,000 people unaccountable 
unaccounted for who voted, but we don't know whether they're eligible or not. So it, it's, it seems like it's small, but there's no way to prove right now because our election system doesn't have the proper checks and balances uh, to prove whether somebody was eligible or not. And that's why all the law changes are, are trying to be done. Because if somebody that's ineligible votes, that takes away the right, it disfranchise, disfranchises the person that is eligible to vote. So, uh, you know, I hear what you're saying, and people say that a lot, and uh, I think it's a, a twist on things. Um, but if you, if you look deeper and think deeper about it, 48,000 people uh, voting where we have no clue who they are that got to vote uh, is just that's bad that's bad news and that is significant uh, so it is a problem so how do you deal with that and the second so I, I appreciate your comment on the second on that on I would go watch the Senate hearing that took place in the Senate Foreign Relations Committee uh, I believe it was last week on the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disability. They do know that it is, a, is an issue uh, with uh, kids, uh, parents that have kids with disability. They, they know that's an issue. And America is doing great. We don't need this treaty. It does not help America one bit. And it does not help influence other countries to whether they implement a treaty or not. That, particular aspect is so detrimental to our uh, just watch the hearings and, and you'll see what Michael Ferris has to say so I appreciate your call uh, thank you very much and appreciate you watching the, the show um, all right we got another phone call uh, caller do you have a comment or question uh, yes thank you very much for taking my call and you know, I really do appreciate uh, the other callers' questions. Mm -hmm. And this issue about citizens being able to have the right to vote, it is so important. And right. I will tell you that in this last election, I had, and by the way, this is Diana Longley. Hi, and Diana. I just, I just, you know, recently ran for mayor of sure. Maplewood. But I, I had a number of senior citizens who called me who wanted to get out to vote. And, you know, it wasn't the issue that they, you know, didn't have an ID, that they weren't registered. It was actually that they had no way to get to vote. They had no way to call up somebody at City Hall and say, can you bring your city staff to our apartment complex and set up a day when we can do absentee voting? Because, you know, they do have that, let's right. say, for instance, at the nursing home, Right. at one of the other care facilities, but there's, you know, other senior citizen uh, uh, living complexes throughout Maplewood where people were saying, you know, we want to get out to vote, but we don't have a way to do so, and that they're in wheelchairs, right. they don't have the proper, you know, vehicles to get through, and if they were to use the bus, if it was raining that day, they're worried that their electric cars are carts, you know, their, their right. wheelchairs, that they're not going to, you know, operate properly in the rain once they get off the bus. And, you know, I've heard that from a number of them. And so if we are concerned about people being able to exercise the right to vote, and we need to, at the city of Maplewood, have a program where people can say, you know what, I would like to register in advance and say that, you know what, if I can't make it, is there some kind of carpooling available? Is there some way well, to get to a caller, can they do... And, and that's an issue. Yeah, can they do absentee balloting? I mean, you don't have to go in. Can't you just mail oh, it in? Well, that's true. I mean, you, you could if you planned ahead. Right. But it, it sometimes, you know, people think about, you know, they get their campaign literature... At the last minute, right. I mean, in this campaign, we saw that. Yeah. We saw that there was negative campaigning at the last minute, so then the candidates had to scramble in order to get their campaign literature out there to try to refute the false claims. And so when they did that, then people said, you know what, that's right, I want to get out there. I want to make my voice heard, but by that time, the absentee ballot, it's too late. Yeah. 
Well, I, I, didn't they? I know they used to go out to these uh, uh, senior citizen places and register people and, and get them to absentee vote. Well, that's true. Did, and it, like I did said, they just they not do, do it this time? The Ramsey County Nursing Home, I believe that there's a couple of other uh, senior complexes that uh -huh. they do it at, but they don't do it at all of them. And so if indeed we have a commitment to ensuring that our senior citizens who are, uh, you know, you know, uh, homebound right. need to, you know, get out the vote if they're yeah. not able to get that absentee ballot application in on time. You know, we should maybe have a yep. network of uh, some way of rides to uh, help them with that. And not just senior citizens well, that are homebound, but it could be anybody. Yeah, I, I agree, but I think that's really up to the candidates. You know, well, I, that, I don't, that, I don't that, think that, <laughs> <laughs> I don't think the state should be doing that for people. You know, right, I think right. it's up to the candidates. Well, and, and, but and see, the, if the city <laughs> is going out to some senior complexes, but not to all of yeah, them, right. how do they pick and choose? And that, so if you've that's chosen a, to go that's to a big some, point. but not all. Yeah. Okay. Good points there. Thank you, Diana. All right. Uh, I would also, boy, I'd like to... There's also what I hear going on is there's a definite defamation lawsuit uh, been filed against Ask Me um, in this Maplewood uh, race. Uh, so we'll give you updates on that uh, when we know more about what's going on. So I just heard some defamation lawsuits have been filed and I got to find out more information. I haven't done my homework on that except for knowing that they've been filed.